Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Again, like James, also thank you for um, uh, putting up with me having this talk in English. Um, every time I come to Germany, I always think I'm going to go away and learn German. Every time I come back and I continue to speak in English. So uh, my apologies. Uh, I'd like to thank James. You're a hard act to follow, James. So um, bear with me. Um, and um, I'm going to talk here about, um, particularly about the role of research within the organization and how research can act as an agent of change, an agent of positive change. I'm going to talk about this in relation to one particular research project that's going, uh, which is called Inclusive Futures. Um, but I think that Inclusive Futures is indicative of a kind of wider approach to research that we're taking within Tate. So I'd like to sort of share a bit about that wider approach as well. Um, and as has been said, um, Inclusive Futures is a project, uh, it is a research project, but it's really a, uh, what in English would be called an action research project. So it's, a, it's, it's research that's specifically set out in order to improve our practice and inform our work in the organization, and uh, particularly around issues around diversity, inclusion, and equity. And um, it's very um, specifically set up to be an organization-wide research activity. So it started out um, as a small project, as is often the case, uh, and then has expanded to include beyond the, the two core areas that we were originally going to focus on, which was curatorial and learning. And now the idea is, is this research project goes across all, our, um, all the activities of the kind of modern and contemporary art museum. And that includes retail, catering, security, finance. Um, a lot of those teams that perhaps don't necessarily get think that they have a role in this work, but actually play an incredibly important role in changing the institution. And the aim of the project is really to provide insights into how Tate can shift how it works going forward and become much more inclusive in terms of its leadership its strat and its strategies. So it's really a project about institutional change and institutional learning. The project, as I say, has a kind of interesting history. Um, it in part came out of um, my own experience and perhaps my own frustrations with the institution. I've worked within museum education for 20, over 20 years, and I've worked at Tate for over 10. Um, and in that time, I've mainly worked within the field of education, learning, and outreach. And and, and there's been a great deal of work within the, that area around um, trying to diversify, reach out to audiences who don't normally come to the museum. A huge amount of great deal of really good work has been done. And yet my own frustration really was, why has there not been fundamental change within the institutions that I've worked in? All this great work has happened, all these projects, these initiatives, these strategies, why does the institution not, has it not changed as much as I would have expected it to? So I started having this conversation um, with this wonderful researcher, Dr. Karen Salt, who at the time, uh, this was in 2017, at the time she was based at uh, the Center for Research in Race and Rights at the University of Nottingham. And Karen is a social scientist. She has a long history of working with community organizations, thinking about and addressing issues of equity. Um, and she uh, said, I'd really love to come and work with you at Tate. And why don't we do a, set up a project to really interrogate this issue of how come a lot of this work um, happens and then disappears. During the course of the project, she shifted her role, so she's no longer based in the university, uh, and she now works for one of the, um, well, she works for the organization that funds academic research in the UK, which is called UK Research and Innovation. 
However, she's retained her role on this project and she is actually now defined as our research futures fellow. So she works with us and she occupies a really crucial position within this research project. I'm myself a very mindful, as James has said about himself, I'm a white middle-class cisgendered woman um, who, you know, comes with a lot of great intentions, but also comes with a particular identity. Um, and it felt very, very important to me that we work with somebody who had not only a huge amount of academic knowledge, but also had a lived experience um, within this uh, particular area. And Karen is really upfront about what her lived experience is. She's talked about how she's walked into the university when she was a professor and uh, someone walked up to her and handed her a bag of rubbish and said, can you deal with this? Uh, she's talked about how she's walked into cultural organizations and there's no assumption that she comes with the expertise that she has. And the first time that um, she gave a presentation to staff, she talked about this. And I think in terms of building trust around what, the ins what this project could achieve, her sharing that lived experience really made a profound difference in terms of what staff then felt they were able to share with her. So I, I can't underestimate the importance of having her as a role model, co-investigator and critical friend on the project. This project could not operate without Karen and it could not operate without Karen as an external coming in to co-investigate these questions with us. <clears throat> so Karen came up with this idea of, the, uh, of thinking about the first year of the project as being an investigation of what she called ghost projects. And ghost projects are these initiatives, ideas, and projects that have been undertaken at the museum that are focused on power, equality, diversity, inclusion, and social justice, but that have somehow failed to land, as she said, or failed to um, become central to the organization's practice going forward. And she talked about how these projects can haunt the organization without being incorporated as sustainable practice. And they can haunt them in two ways. They can haunt them because either they were <clears throat> deemed to be unsuccessful or really problematic, in which case the institution does its works incredibly hard to bury them and forget them, or they haunt them because they were successful and yet the learnings from it, are from those successful projects, do not come into the institutional practice. So there's a sense of, but we've done all this, and then 10 years later, or even five years later, we do it all over again. And we surface and face the same issues that we faced the first time around. And so there was this kind of crazy uh, dysfunctionality around this. Um, so, so we thought, okay, we're gonna, go, we're gonna explore what the ghost projects are. And I just give you a couple of examples. I mean, and there were, as I, I'll go on to say, there were, we've amassed a huge number of ghost projects. But I'll just give you a couple of examples. So for example, there was this extraordinary display that happened at Tate Britain in 1995. And, and the display was called Picturing Blackness in British Art, uh, 1700 to the 1990s. So this is drawing on works that are in the Tate collection. Tate holds the National Collection of British Art uh, from the 1700s. Uh, it was, I think, the first time in the institutional history that there'd ever been a display that focused on, on work by BAME artists. And it was um, selected by an external curator, Paul Gilroy, and a Tate curator, and it featured 14 works of art, mostly drawn from the Tate collection, and it juxtaposed images from across uh, two centuries. And, and it had a very um, overt and clear agenda to address some of the myths of Britishness and to recognize that there were works being made by BAME artists that represented BAME member um, individuals, uh, but that somehow had become literally whitewashed in, in our institutional and cultural history. Now, this was an extraordinary uh, thing for the institution to undertake. When we asked colleagues if any of them had heard of this display, 
almost none of them had. So there was a sense of what happened to that? Why did it disappear? Why was there not a sense that we needed to really acknowledge that within our institutional history? And why are the works that were put in that display, uh, why did they not necessarily get a permanent place in the displays since then? So that's an example of, of a kind of curatorial ghost project. Another example of a, of a, um, of a, of a, of a ghost project that happened within the learning team. So Seeing Through was an extraordinary initiative that happened um, within, the, again, the Tate Britain learning team. From, ha, took place from 2009 to 2012. And this was an artist-led project that was working with care teams. So these are the, uh, the folks who look after young people that are in care. Uh, and uh, it was a really in-depth investigation, uh, again, using research, investigation, making an interpretation, which was led by young people in care, which brought them into the gallery on a regular basis over three years. Extraordinary things happened in that project in terms of empowering young people, making the gallery space available, um, really questioning that relationship between ownership of the institutional space, who gets to come. Um, <clears throat> there, is a, there is a website, but again, in terms of institutional memory, it's very hard to locate where that project sits now. And for people and uh, younger colleagues coming in who work in the Young People's Programme team, they don't necessarily have access to that project or, or are able to learn from it. So it's again, it's that sense of this great practice that happens that somehow seems to disappear. And I don't know whether that's the same in your organisations, that there is a history of good practice, but it's often really invisible. So... The way that Inclusive Futures has gone so far <clears throat> is that over the 12 months from September until August, Karen essentially set out to meet with as many members of staff as she could. She held workshops at all four of the Tate sites and she gave um, a presentation. She, well, she and I were in conversation. It's filmed. That is on the Tate. I think it's on the Tate. No, it's not on the Tate website, sorry. It's on the Tate intranet site, our internal site. Um, and she invited staff to contribute whatever projects they had to her. And very um, clearly, she did not define for them what constituted a ghost project. She invited staff to define for themselves what constituted a project that was dealing with issues of inclusion, diversity, and equity. Um, she uh, had some very intense conversations with staff, many of whom saw in her an opportunity in, in that conversation with her to share some of their kind of frustrations with how the institution had worked, but also an opportunity to really celebrate the work that they had done, but also colleagues had done. Um, I think we were both really taken aback by the response of staff. There's been this very positive response to it. People have gone back and literally from their own archives at home brought in material uh, and given it to her and said, this is really important, I want you to have this. There have been timelines of work going back to sort of 10 to 15 years. Um, the uh, HR department that James worked in put together this incredible portfolio of material of the initiatives that, that, that they as a department have done. Uh, and, it, and it became clear, clear to us that we needed to extend this, um, this period of the project. So whereas we, I think, perhaps naively thought, oh, we, we can do this first part in three months, we actually extended it for the whole year. So Karen met with staff over three years. I mean, over, sorry, over the whole year. And then we obviously realized that um, that was only the first part of the project. So we have now extended the whole project for another year. So originally it was a one year initiative. Uh, it's now a two year initiative. And, and I think one of the things that's particularly extraordinary about Inclusive Futures is that normally uh, for research projects, we have to go to uh, external funders. So we go to either the academic um, 
the funders who fund academic research or a trust or a foundation. In this instance, Tate has uh, decided that it will fund this research. So this project is core funded from Tate's own budget. And again, I think the signal that that has sent to staff has been very important because the message has come, we value this work, we value um, your, you know, your historic input into this work, so we will fund uh, this research project and um, the directors have agreed that they will extend it and fund it for a second year. Um, so where we're at is that we have all this extraordinary material. We have all these incredible ghost projects. Um, what are we going to do with them? Because uh, Karen is holding them because one of the um, important messages that also came across to Tate was one of confidentiality. And this is again is important that she's an external researcher, is that they entrusted material to her. However, the whole point of the project is that we surface material in order that we can learn from it. So the fact that it's sitting with Karen actually at the moment is, is, is clear that it's only half of the story. But what Karen has done thus far is to do a kind of analysis both in terms of her experience of the first year and also what the kind of ghost projects are telling us and she's just literally this week given me um, her kind of interim report and what the kind of emerging themes and the findings are and I'll just share some of the things that come out of her um, interim report and one of the things that she's really uh, observed, and James has touched on this, is this sense of how, um, it, it's the question of value. It's not only how the work is valued, but how staff's input into this work is valued. Um, and the way Karen has presented it within the interim report, which I really like, is that she hasn't documented one narrative or episode, but she's created particular scenarios, or she's described these scenarios, which are emblematic or representative of the types of encounters in which this idea of value emerged. So I'm just gonna read you one of these scenarios. So this is scenario one. A manager or a lead team member asks a member of staff to do X. An X is something that is tied to or is part of a larger equality, diversity, or inclusion initiative or idea. The staff member takes up this role, but immediately encounters issues with resourcing this. Turning back to the manager or lead team member is not helpful, as that person does not have access to additional funds and cannot easily draw on other teams to help or assist the member of staff. The staff member then goes from team to team, obtaining support, or in some cases, financial assistance for X. X occurs and is stressful for the member of staff, but an overall positive experience for Tate. Tate then acknowledges X, but does not thank or acknowledge the work of the staff member or the difficulties they encountered in making X happen. When faced with the chance to do X again, the staff member questions Tate's commitment and whether they want to take this on, especially if X is not seen as part of their core work or appreciated as part of their role. This brings up a number of questions or issues. There are questions about the manner in which the institution supports initiatives and the ease in which creativity is supported and encouraged across the, the organization. There is also a related issue about the legacy of this work and where it sits within the organization. While this work may be valued at the local level within the organization, there is a wider message that the institution does not capture, evaluate, or learn from these activities, so that there is no way at any one time to know the vibrant work undertaken by staff. So I don't know if that scenario resonates with any of you that have worked in institutions. Um, and I'm being really honest here, um, and I think there is, uh, again, 
In my experience of working within uh, organizations and at Tate, I would say that I, ha I am really encouraged by what was happening at the moment. And I think this is a field that is moving incredibly fast. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I mean this absolutely genuinely, that there's an enormous amount of great work that's being done. Uh, and James is leading a lot of that really fantastic work. But this is the historic position of how this work has tended to sit within this institution. And I think it's really important that we acknowledge this. Um, Tate is uh, an extraordinary, amazing, creative, uh, dynamic, ambitious institution. Um, and it expects a huge amount from its staff. Uh, and uh, on one hand, it's brilliant at saying to people, yes, go, do it. That's a really good idea. Do it, do it. Uh, and on the other hand, it's also not so brilliant at going, how are we going to do this? And how are we going to support staff? And how are we going to recognize the toll that that takes on staff in order to do this work? And I think James has really touched on this and is super aware of this, which is fantastic because I think things are changing. But I, in a sense, share this with you just as a kind of... Um, just to be mindful and to reiterate the message that James has put across that this is hard, this work. And I think that, that there is a huge amount of appetite within the institution for this work, but also a recognition that the institution needs to, uh, in, in, in a, you know, it needs to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. There is, there is, you know, there is, I think, a huge institutional commitment to it. And now we need to be really thinking, how are we going to do this in a sustainable way? And I think one of the ways that Inclusive Futures is really interesting um, is these other questions around um, institutional memory and learning. So I come back to this, this notion around um, if, if the institution really values something, it keeps it. So we archive all our curatorial practice uh, and we have an extraordinary uh, gallery records and archive of everything that's done. Very, very little of this work is in, that, is in that gallery records. So what does this tell us about how the institution has historically valued this practice? And, um, and what is it that we can go to in terms of the institution to learn from what's happened before, what are the mistakes, what are the challenges, what are the opportunities, who are the people that we've worked with that we could go back to and say, you know, we've had this long-standing relationship with you, how can we build on that? Um, so I think one of the key learnings for um, Inclusive Futures is about how do we think about archiving this practice in a way that both recognizes the value of it and sits it, locates it in a place where we can access it and learn from it. Um, the other thing I'd just like to touch on briefly is the significance of locating this as a research project and the idea of collaborative research being uh, a methodology for investigating uh, difficult issues within the institution. Uh, I think one of the key things about research um, is that research is underpinned by questions. So framing something as an open investigation uh, is, is a, it creates an open space. So there is this in, this, in a sense, a kind of generosity in saying, we don't know the answer to this, but we've got a good question, and we want to explore that question. And, and I think one of the really important things about uh, inclusive futures is this sense of the message that's gone out to staff is we want to investigate this question with you. We don't want to investigate you. We don't want to do some kind of analysis looking at you as if you're a set of laboratory rats. We want you to be an active part of this investigation with us. And I think it, that in itself is really important in, in communicating that message around um, the value of you, your expertise as a member of staff, and acknowledging that you as a member of staff had an incredibly important contribution to make in terms of creating this. Um, I think the third thing is about research is, uh, and it's not always easy even with research, to keep it flexible and open-ended, to genuinely have a sense of we don't know where this is going, but we want this to be a really important investigation. 
Um, we don't have a pre set uh, you know, point that we need to get to or, or a set of answers. It is really about how do we find out more about what has happened? And I think um, alongside that is this important uh, question of, but we do want to be providing evidence in order to support our arguments for why we might make particular decisions about something. Um, so James has talked about the importance of having diversity data, which I think is really crucial. But similarly, having evidence to be able to go, actually, it really doesn't work if you uh, use language like hard to reach. I don't know if you have that term in German. That sense of uh, the audiences that we go out to are defined as hard to reach when actually it's us, the institution, that is hard to reach. They're incredibly, you know, they, they aren't, you know, we might find them hard to reach, but actually they're very easy to reach. We are impenetrable. So, uh, and that has come up time and again in, in projects that we've run, yet you can still find that language slipping into the kind of work. Uh, and immediately the barriers go up, and it's like, why do we not learn? Uh, so, so making the evidence of our previous work available is really, really crucial. Um, I've put here having uh, the head of research as a project lead, not because I think I'm a genius, but having a senior member of, a relatively senior member of staff as the kind of institutional representative, uh, I think is important on a project like this, not least because I sit in meetings with other senior members of staff and can advocate for this work. And then finally, um, just that within Tate, we are, um, we've recently published a new Tate research strategy. And in, with the strategy, uh, there is this clear articulation of how we want research to be this critical space where, um, and I use the language of staying with the trouble which is this idea that research is a space where we can investigate difficult things, uh, not necessarily that we can, as I say, to come up with an answer, but that we can provide a space where the institution can ask difficult questions and can recognize that there are things which are uh, about uh, disagreeing and conflict, but unless we address those, we as an institution will not move forward. Um, and just to say that um, what's coming up in the next year. So we have um, a further nine months of the project, which is great. And we have three agendas really for next year. Um, a really, really important one is that we will be bringing the ghost projects back into the institution. That's, that's our key driver. But we will be bringing them back both in terms of how do we frame them as an institutional archive uh, so I'm doing, uh, we're doing lots of work with our gallery records team around wh how do we frame it um, and then how do we make it available. We have lots of um, legislative issues we have to deal with in terms of what information we can make available. Um, but we also have uh, a Freedom of Information Act. So although the institution itself might feel anxious about, you know, exposing some projects perhaps that didn't go as well as we would have liked. Uh, we are bound by a Freedom of Information Act to make certain information available. So a bit like James is saying, you know, we can call on particular laws. We can call on the Freedom of Information Act to say we need to make this kind of information available. Um, but again, I would stress we don't want to do it in order to make, uh, you know, we're not here to critique the institution for, for critique's sake. We are here to learn, reflect, and do things differently based on what we know. So, so it's not about pointing fingers at people and going, well, that was terrible. It is about, okay, what do we learn from that so we don't make that mistake again? And I think there is a real sense within the institution of that is how we want to move forward with this work. I think everyone recognizes that people come with good intentions. It's just that sometimes the institutional systems and structures act against this kind of work. And it's how do we uh, genuinely try to nudge the, you know, nudge those issues forward, as James has said, 
to a better place. And so we're going to be holding a series of workshops with staff uh, and really, again, involving staff in terms of posing the question, how do we learn from this and what are the changes we need to make? and really asking staff to be involved actively in terms of proposing ways forward. Um, and I would add that um, we see this very much in terms of working with James and all the work that he's doing. This is, this is again, not about um, acting as a kind of counter to all the fantastic work that James is doing. It's about, in a sense, providing evidence in order to support his work. So I'm going to stop there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Come to me. Thank you very much.